Hey there. Welcome to a bit of a different video today where I'll be exploring a couple of larger concepts around mindset that I think are going to be really useful for anyone wanting to have a long and sustainable career in the creative industries. I talk a lot about practicing and learning new skills, but mastering your craft is really just the beginning, and returning to a beginner's mindset is essential to keep the creative fire alive long term. When you can combine the skills you've mastered with the curiosity and creativity of a beginner, that's when the real magic happens. So if you're just starting your creative career, or you're a seasoned professional looking to rekindle your creativity, stick around while we explore how embracing a beginner's mindset can expand and accelerate your creative practice. If you're new here, I'm James. I'm an illustration agent in the UK. I work with some of the industry's leading professional illustrators. I'm also the author of The Illustrator's Guide, a career guide for new illustrators looking to establish themselves in the industry. In the process of writing that book, I read a lot of books on all kinds of subjects, and there are two that I want to explore today that aren't directly related to the creative industry, but there's a lot of useful insights in them for any kind of creative professional. The first is Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind by Shunryu Suzuki. And the second is Robert Greene's Mastery. The first book, as the title suggests, talks a lot about the mindset of a beginner. And mastery, unsurprisingly, is about how someone can become a master of their skills or profession. Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind is a classic text on Zen Buddhism from the 70s, which has been a minor area of personal interest for me, so I didn't expect that it would have many useful insights related to my work. But here are a few topics I highlighted and made notes on when I first read it. Approaching life with an open, curious, and eager mindset. How we shouldn't get too attached to outcomes. How separating things into binaries, good or bad, success or failure, isn't useful. The importance of consistent practice. The value of continuous learning. I'm sure you'll agree there's plenty in there that we can apply to a creative career. Mastery is a fantastic book for anyone wanting to get really good at what they do. It's packed with interesting ideas, but I'm really just gonna focus in on one of the author's concepts, which he calls the dimensional mind. We'll get into that a little bit later. What is the beginner's mind? Essentially, it's about approaching our studies of a particular subject or skill with an attitude of openness, an eagerness to learn all about it, and not letting any preconceived ideas we may have about the subject hamper our learning. If you imagine a child learning a new skill that they enjoy, they ask a lot of questions because they want to know all about it. They really want to learn how to do this thing, a card trick or a cartwheel or whatever it may be. They also don't have much experience or knowledge of anything, so they listen to their teacher and they don't apply any unhelpful context to what they're learning. They are the opposite of an expert. Here's a quote from the book that illustrates the point. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the expert's mind, there are few. When people come to think of themselves as experts, naturally they can become a bit closed-minded. They have a lot of experience, and they do know a lot. They've done things a certain way for a long time, and it's worked for them, so they may not feel like they need to consider alternative approaches or new ideas. But as time moves on and the world changes, experts who aren't open to learning new things and upgrading their skills and knowledge can get left behind. This is where practicing the beginner's mindset can keep someone creative and fresh. When I was at university studying illustration, I wasn't really open to what my teachers were telling me, and I really regret it. It was a combination of having a little bit of early natural talent and the overwhelming arrogance of my youth that told me I should do what I thought was right and not take on the feedback and suggestions of my teachers. Then, only after losing access to those teachers did I realize how little I knew and how unprepared I was for the professional world. So how can we approach our learning and work without preconceptions? Here are a few ideas. Let go of expectations focus on the process, not the outcome, and seek new experiences and diverse perspectives. If you're going down the illustration route, you might get a short overview of what it is at school as part of an art or graphic design class, then learn some basics at college, then go more in depth at university and experiment with it, if you go that route, or you can learn from books, videos, online courses. Either way, you build up a level of experience and knowledge. You then go out into the world ready to become an illustrator, thinking you have all the skills you need to make it into a career. Then, like me, you may discover that you've still got a lot of learning to do, and that can be disappointing and frustrating. You had an expectation that wasn't met, and the outcome you wanted is still a way off. 
If you can let go of whatever expectations you may have and know that there is always something left to learn, you won't be disappointed. When you understand that learning new things is part of the job, you can accept, value, and enjoy that part of the process. You have a particular idea of an outcome you want, of course, but focusing too much on that and not learning to enjoy the process is unhelpful because the desired outcome will change as you reach different milestones in your career. But the process of learning and improving never will. So the care and attention you give to the process is much more important than the outcome. My goal last year was to write a book. I could have focused as much as I wanted on that outcome, but without learning to value and enjoy the process of writing, it would have never got done. Particularly with creative careers where there are so many different paths you could take to become successful, you're always learning from teachers who have their own experience and taste. It's not like law or medicine where you're mainly learning facts. So if you only learn from one teacher, you'll learn through their experience and perhaps come to share their opinions before you've really experienced the industry for yourself. So it's important to seek out different points of view and different teachers so you can see a more balanced view of the industry you want to work in. No two experienced illustrators got to where they are in their career the same way. The good news is, with online learning platforms like YouTube, Skillshare, and Domestica, you can learn from an enormous range of different teachers from different backgrounds with different skills and experience. It's never been easier to get a diverse education in a creative career. If you'd like to get a free month's membership to Skillshare, I'll put a link in the description. The beginner's mind is often applied to Japanese martial arts. I've done Chinese martial arts since I was a teenager, and while I've certainly never mastered any of them, I really do enjoy the process, and I've never really cared about a specific outcome, the black belt or whatever. I've got a bit of experience, so when I tried out a jujitsu class, my expectation was that I'd do okay. Well, I was on my ass within about four seconds. All that experience of one way of approaching martial arts, Chinese Kung Fu, counted for nothing when faced with a different system of martial arts and a whole new set of rules. Had I spent 15 years learning different forms of martial arts from around the world, maybe I would have stayed on my feet for eight or nine seconds instead. How to approach creative work. The process of producing creative work and sharing that work with the world and potential clients can sometimes be frustrating or disappointing, but often rewarding and exciting too. A lot of philosophies suggest that the distinctions we make in our way of thinking, mind and body, good and evil, are part of the same unified whole. I'm not going to get into that here, but when we think of some of the binary comparisons that we make with creative work, this is good, this is bad, I am successful, I am a failure, and so on, maybe we can find a more helpful way of thinking about it. If you're prone to looking at your own work and then looking at the creative work of others and feeling like your work isn't up to their standard, theirs is good and yours is bad, what we could do instead is view both as points on a graph of continuous improvement. You might be down here on the graph, looking at someone else that's up here. At some point in the past, they were down here too, looking at somebody else who was up here. But now they're here, they may well have somebody that they're looking up to up here, and they're thinking they're not very good either. And that person up there will have people they look up to too. So who's right? Who is good and who is bad? It doesn't really matter, because there's no one right way to make a living as a creative. Comparing your work to others can occasionally be motivating, but it's mostly unhelpful. And if you're in the habit of comparing yourself and your work to other people, it doesn't matter how far up the graph you go, because there's always going to be someone you can compare yourself to and feel bad about what you do. If your desired outcome at the moment is to get to here, then once you do, you'll want to get to there too. This really comes back to focusing on the process and not the outcome. With every new illustration you create, photo you take or sentence you write, you can aim to make it the best you can. If you keep doing that, the baseline of what you think is good will increase over time and you'll move up that graph without needing to compare it to what anyone else is doing. If you think in terms of good and bad, pause and ask yourself, compared to what? Your work might not be as technically skilled as an illustrator who's been doing it for 10 years, but you're more technically proficient than you were a year ago. You also have the benefit of being able to learn from that experienced illustrator. So in 10 years, the quality of your work may surpass where they are 10 years in. If you think in terms of success or failure, what ultra successful billionaire doesn't have a few good failure stories to tell? They're not failures if they were stepping stones along the right path. They're tests, experiments, and opportunities to learn and grow. They are necessary steps if you really want to be good at what you do. If you've never lost out on a job or made a mistake or failed at something, then you've missed out on all those chances to learn something useful and improve your work and your resilience. Consistent practice. Zen Buddhism values consistent practice and routine. That consistent practice may be in meditation or painting or calligraphy, for example, and the routine may well involve what appears to be doing the same thing over and over again. 
getting up and going to bed at the same time, performing different chores, or making sure your home is always organized with everything in its place. To some, that may seem monotonous and boring, and a Zen monk's lifestyle certainly isn't for everyone. But if you're not consistent in the way you practice your skills, or you send your work out to clients without a routine, or only when you feel like it, of course you're gonna get inconsistent results. A little bit every day will get much more consistent results than a few hours here, or 20 minutes there, and days or weeks when you don't do any creative work at all. This is really noticeable if you've ever tried to learn a musical instrument. If you do an hour a day for a year, you'll improve at a really quick rate. To get to the same level with inconsistent practice might take two or three years, if not more. When you commit to doing something consistently, you change not only in the development of the skill itself, but in the way you think and the enthusiasm you have for it. That kind of rapid improvement is really motivating and will make you want to keep going. Consistent practice doesn't just improve your skills, it shapes your character. I read another book some time ago called Good to Great by Jim Collins. It's about how good companies become great ones. In it, he describes the flywheel effect and offers a metaphor of a large heavy wheel that a business has to push round with its daily operating activities, sales calls, marketing, customer service, that kind of thing. At first, it turns very slowly and it takes a lot of effort. But over time, the effort of doing those things to a high standard consistently means the wheel starts to turn faster and faster with the same amount of effort. When the wheel is turning quickly and the business is making lots of sales and the customers are happy and the shareholders are happy, it's not down to any one turn of the wheel. It's because of all the consistent pushing in the same direction over time. Now for you, that might be making new work and updating your portfolio. It might be the new skills you're learning and making sure you're sending your work out to clients on a regular basis. Every time you push, the easier it gets. The importance of continuous learning. As I mentioned earlier, it's possible that when we get to a certain point in our career, when we're getting paid well and we're getting good reactions to our work, and if other people consider us an expert, we may choose to get comfortable in that position and stop pushing hard to keep improving. It makes a lot of sense. If things are going well and people like what we do, then why not just enjoy the success? And that is fine. We should take time to appreciate where we've been and where we are. Ambition is a powerful driving force for improvement, but it has to be balanced with valuing the stage you're currently at, or you'll never be happy. But trends change and technology moves on. What was in fashion five years ago is old news now. For someone wanting to have a long career as a creative freelancer, you have to change with the times. If you can't, your career, no matter how successful it is, will be a short one. The ambition and drive that takes you from beginner to professional changes over time as your priorities change. And maybe you can afford to work all the hours you can in the early days and really go for it full speed, but that's unsustainable for most people over the long term. You don't need that kind of intensity once you've got to a comfortable level, but you do need to be willing to evolve and stay interested in learning new things. If you can adopt the beginner's mindset early of enjoying the process and learning and improving and keeping it long term, this won't be difficult. It'll just be part of your character. I could sit back and just do my job and then spend my evenings watching TV, but after a while I get bored with that. Learning new skills and trying out new hobbies and thinking about different projects I can work on in my spare time keeps me interested. And I only need to look at my dad, who's nearly 80 and showing no signs of slowing down to know that I'm on the right track. He's interested in lots of things and he has lots of hobbies and it's working out great for him. Here he is driving one of his latest projects. I enjoy learning, but it's hard sometimes. Learning new skills means you are constantly put back in the beginner's class. But the combination of all those different skills you pick up along the way will feed your creativity. It could be drawing, photography, typography, watercolor painting, filmmaking, glass blowing, bedazzling. Anything you learn how to do could give you new ideas for one of the other things you already know how to do, and you'll connect with other creative people who will offer more diverse points of view and give you new ideas to think about. Steve Jobs once said that creativity is just connecting things. The more you learn and the more skills you try out, the more connections you'll be able to make. Robert Greene's dimensional mind concept shares a lot of similarities with the beginner's mind, but I think it builds on it in a really interesting way. He describes three different mindsets, the original mind, the conventional mind, and the dimensional mind. The starting point for most people is the original mind. This is a very similar idea to the beginner's mind. When we're children, our minds are completely open and we come up with all sorts of crazy original ideas with no filter or embarrassment. We're full of questions and we can be really absorbed and amazed by things that we come to take for granted when we get older. When we're young, we feel things more intensely because everything is new. If you think about your favorite movie from your childhood, or the first time you were in love, or the first breakup you had, those memories and experiences are really powerful and 
vivid. As time goes on and we build up a bank of experiences and memories, things get a bit less intense. Every new thing we experience, we can kind of relate to something else. So our feelings about those new things are influenced by our life experience, and we come to see things through a particular lens. We can also become a bit defensive about the way we look at the world, and a bit less open to change. This is what Robert Greene calls the conventional mind. It's when people grow up, become influenced by their peers, and want to fit in and conform to societal norms. They learn and they grow, but some people can lose a bit of that childlike spirit. They can accumulate knowledge and climb the ranks in their career and become experts at what they do, but it's a conventional path where they're not really flexible or creative. Some other people do hold on to their original childlike wonder through their lives, but they aren't able to apply it to mastering a skill. They want to do lots of different things, and they try a lot, but never really commit to a path or have the discipline to see things through. Real masters, whether it be illustration or anything else, can retain the spirit of the original mind, but they can also apply themselves, commit to a path, and focus very intently on what it is they're trying to achieve. Throughout the process of accumulating profound knowledge of a subject or skill, they still have a playful approach to it, and they remain open to new ways of doing things, which is very much what the beginner's mind is all about. Robert Greene refers to this as the dimensional mind, which, simply put, is the ability of a true master to commit to learning their skill, but also to never allow their previous experience or habits to limit their creativity. They have the knowledge about their subject and the flexibility to use that knowledge in new and creative ways. So here's how you can practice cultivating your dimensional mind. Define the conventional path you're on, being a freelance illustrator, for example, and think about the necessary steps to get there. Engage in exercises that allow your imagination and creativity to run wild, not necessarily related to your work, daydreaming, painting, Lego, whatever. Learn from diverse sources. Learn different skills from different teachers with different opinions and experiences. Practice connecting ideas. What you discover from playing with Lego could inform what you make in a pottery class, for example. Reflect on what you've learned. When you come up with a new creative idea, break it down again and figure out how you got there. Stay curious. Whatever you think you know, question it and see if you can find different ways of doing things. We are creatures of habit, and sticking to tried and tested methods is efficient, it saves us a lot of time, but the mind is like a muscle. If you lift a lot of weights, you'll get good at lifting weights, and your muscles will become accustomed to lifting heavy things and grow in a way that supports that kind of exercise. If you then go and try to do a yoga class for the first time, your muscles will be tight and inflexible. If you expose yourself to new ideas and new ways of doing things, you'll be put in uncomfortable situations where you're learning from scratch and you're a beginner again, but you'll stretch your mind and see that the other skills you learn can be combined with what you already know and support whatever your primary goal is. Your mind will be flexible and you'll be able to think more creatively. We've talked about the importance of approaching your work with an open mind and not closing yourself off to new ways of doing things. We've discussed how important it is to focus more on the process and less on the outcome, and we've thought about how good or bad or success or failure are relative, and simply offer us more opportunities to learn and grow. Consistent practice and continuous learning are so important to any creative career, so whatever stage you're at, try being a beginner again for a while and see what you can learn, and don't be an expert. I hope you found this interesting. I really do recommend this book for anyone working on their creative skills. There's so much more I could talk about in there, but I've rambled on long enough for one day. See you next time. Thank <laughs> you.